欢迎大家来到我们第二十四届 Sophia 人文节的开幕讲座。呃，我是今天的主持人，呃，张韵杰。我呢是复旦大学哲学院流动站的博士后，然后我的研究方向是环境伦理学，然后我也对规则伦理学跟呃价值原理等等感兴趣。呃 ，Sophia 人文节呢，其实是我们复旦大学哲学院一年一度的一个重要活动，从今天开始到五月五号，呃，我们会有七场不同的讲座，围绕的题目呢是非万能回答机。它的寓意是我们认为哲学就像是非万能回答机，是没有百科全书式的现成答案的。但是哲学却有着对问题的关切，然后也有着对思想的传承与碰撞。所以，我们第二十四届的这个主题呢，就是想用哲学的方式去对话现代科技，然后审视现代科技。也希望在场的所有呃同学、老师们都来参与我们这个从四月。到五月的七场讲座，然后我们今天的第一个讲座呢是米切姆教授的呃、uh, Thoughts on How to Practice Philosophy in a Non-Philosophic World。米切姆教授是美国著名的呃、uh, 技术哲学家，然后他是科罗拉多矿业学院人文艺术和社会科学荣誉教授，然后他最近呢还受邀我们复旦大学哲学院成为我们的这个外国的驻院学者。Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Mitchum. Well, it's really, really nice to be here. The title I've given my talk is Thoughts on How to Practice Philosophy in a Non-Philosophic World. A world dominated by science and technology is one in which philosophy is practiced only on the margins. Even when it is politically declared to be ever more necessary, because of the gap that is opening up between scientific knowledge, technological power, and wisdom, we don't always know what to do, even though we often know how to do it. But before rushing into this fraught topic, I must begin by thanking Sal Dake. And the other members of the Student Council of the School of Philosophy here at Fudan University, who invited me to give this guest lecture contribution to the Sophia Festival, dedicated to the theme, non-omnipotent answering machine. My sincere thanks also, of course, to Professor Wang Guoyu, for inviting me to visit Fudan University, thus making the Student Council invitation possible. Today nears the end of my first week of a first visit to mainland China after a three years COVID enforced absence. It's a great pleasure for me to be able to return to China, to renew an engagement that stretches back to the, my first visit to China in 1992, in what for me has been a defining philosophical experience. Of my last three decades of life, and now of my old age, because I'm kind of an old guy, and to be able once more to meet in person with colleagues and students here in China, I can't help but be reminded of Confucius' words: "To study, and in due times practice what one has studied, is this not a pleasure? When friends come from distant places, is this not a joy?" Chinese students are some of the best in the world. This is not just a courteous compliment; I mean it quite literally. At least on the basis of my teaching experience, mostly in the United States, it's true, but in some European countries as well. I've missed being challenged by Chinese students, sometimes simply by virtue of your representation. Of the oldest continuous civilization in the world, to think more deeply about things that I might otherwise do. Indeed, the very title of the supposed so Sophia Festival does precisely this. When the invitation letter arrived, I was initially perplexed by the festival theme title. I emailed. Zhao Dake, 
asking whether non-omnipotent answering machine might be an awkward English translation of the Chinese term for generative pre-trained transformer AI, that it might be Chinglish for something. <laughs> he replied with a translation of the full festival announcement. In an accompanying note, he acknowledged implicit reference to the now widely discussed chat GPT, but as a provo provocative confrontation to the hyperbole its, of its surroundings. As the Sophia Festival announcement has it, the chat GBT answering machine, which aims to provide responses to all questions, no matter how bizarre, and rejects the possibility of being some, something being unanswerable, is an exemplifying peak of techno-scientific aspirations to omnipotence. Yet when faced with an endless, inherently human questioning and the big questions of philosophy, it remains impotent, no matter what it says. I was immediately taken with the festival term, non-omnipotent answering machine. I can't imagine a more apt description of philosophy for our time. It immediately reminds us of words from Socrates at his trial for misleading the youth of the city and impiety, defending his lifelong obstreperous questioning and refusal to take at face value any answer provided by his many interlocutors. The unexamined life is not human living. Hoda and Exterotos, bios o biotos anthropoi. Or, as it is more commonly translated, the unexamined life is not worth living for humans. But as soon as we remember this famous saying, we are flooded with questions. Indeed, the saying itself calls us to question it. Let me consider just two of these possible questions. First, let's focus on the words themselves. The word for humans, anthropoi, is not the same as the Greek word for man, andros as distinct from woman, Ganaka. Anthropos is not gender specific, specific and includes both men and women. So this should dismiss the sometimes charge against Socrates and Plato and Aristotle that they are male chauvinist pigs. Additionally, remembering Heidegger's influence, influential if extremely controversial, etymological interpretation of the alpha privative in the Greek word aletheia, truth, suggests that we might pay attention to the alpha privative here in the word unexamined. The root of the adjective anextastoroth is the verb extasto, to examine, to consider, even to pry into. I'm not a Greek scholar, but it's worth noting that the word is not all that common in Greek, especially in Greek philosophical texts, though it does occur more times in Plato, 29 times, than in Aristotle, only six times. Interestingly, the term is considerably more common in Jewish and Christian, Christian Greek writers of this classical period, such as Philo, Judaeus, and Libanius. Does this hint at anything about the peculiarly argumentative sensibility of Jews and Christians in the early years of the Common Era in the Mediterranean world? My suggestion would be that it does, although I'm not going to pursue it. A more substantive linguistic issue is contained in the bios o biotos, anthropoi, life of living humans, 
one that has been commented on at length by Ivan Illich, one of my teachers, and Giorgio Agamben. Ancient Greek has two different words that are both commonly translated into modern English and modern European languages of all sorts as life. One of these words is zoe, the other is bios. The former is what Agamben calls bare life, something merely physical, physical existence. The latter is the life we live as humans in our biographies, even cultural or rational or spiritual existence. Appreciation of the Greek difference is further complicated by the modern terminology of zoology as the study of animals and biology as the study of all living things, plants as well as animals. I wonder if Chinese translations from Greek cause similar confusions. I was talking on the walk over uh, with the two students who were bringing me and uh, I was informed that in Chinese you just don't you just you don't translate you just use zoe and bios in the uh, in the translation at least of Agamben we weren't sure about in the translation of Plato. Um, the point here is that Socrates is concerned not with bare physical life, physical existence. It's human biographies that are not truly human if they do not include some examination, prying into, even self-examination. Chiseled over the stone gate to the temple of Apollo at Delphi is the word gnothai seaphaton, know yourself, an admonition that Socrates also calls attention to in the Pythagoras, Protagoras. Second, setting etymology and philology aside, although I would suggest that analysis of this sort can be a way to practice philosophy in a non-philosophic world, since it can be a way to smuggle into something that looks like science, that is, philology, a kind of contemplative, even aesthetic reflection of or appreciation of experience. But there is a more existential question. I once proposed by analogy with Socrates' claim that in the ambience of technological productivity, quote, the unexamined engineering life is not worth living for engineers. But how precisely is such examination to take place? Peter Kruis, a Dutch engineering philosopher and colleague, criticized my proposal. He questioned whether there wasn't something of philosophical arrogance, not just in my proposal, but in that of Socrates as well. Cruz explained that his brother was a carpenter, whom he thought had led a good and worthwhile life, without ever subjecting it to critical philosophical questioning. People don't have to be philosophers to be good, he argued. I had to agree that not everyone had to be a philosopher in order to lead a good life. But I wondered whether his brother had not, in fact, in order to be a good carpenter, practiced some level of examination of his work. One of the mottos of good carpenters is measure twice to cut once. In other words, don't be too quick to saw a board off to some particular length. Measure where the board is to be used again, and then measure the length of the board to be cut again before sawing to length. Checking yourself and being careful is a necessary virtue in good carpentry. 
In like manner, good or virtuous engineers might be said necessarily to subject their work to critical examination in multiple ways. Now, I resonate with this, uh, this issue of measuring twice to cut once because I've practiced some carpentry in my own life. I built a house for myself in southern Colorado some years ago um, and worked as a carpenter in my younger years. And I often made the mistake of only measuring once and cutting and then have a board that didn't fit where it belonged. So I was not a virtuous carpenter. I had to learn the hard way. This kind of technical examination or testing as a necessary element in good carpentry has an analogous presence in engineering and in science, the two defining features of our contemporary world. But especially when extended to the practice of engineering, doesn't this run the danger of trivializing what Socrates means by to examine? In his Meditation de la Technica of 1939, one of the first truly philosophical reflections on modern technology, the great Spanish philosopher Jose Ortega y Gasset argued that precisely because engineers are now so powerful and have abilities to design and construct almost anything, quote, to be an engineer and only an engineer is to be potentially everything but actually nothing. More recently, the British American philosopher Alastair McIntyre has also criticized the bureaucrat, the manager, and the engineer for lives founded on means alone, cut loose from ends, and devoid of substantive practical rationality. But to observe the virtuous practice of examining what goes on in good carpentry and good engineering reminds us of something else. At his trial, Socrates gave an account of how it came to be that he interrogated so many people about their claims to wisdom and by punching holes in their claims stimulated so much resentment against him Resentment that led eventually to his trial, conviction, and death. The story is one we all know, but is so resonant and illuminating with regard to the origins and character of philosophy in the West that it deserves to be rehearsed. Socrates describes himself as rejecting the cosmological ambitions of predecessors on the Ionian coast, just across the Aegean Sea from Athens, in a world perhaps more influenced by the cultures of both Egypt and Persia and their grand cosmologies than the lives of the city in Athens. As Cicero was later to describe him, Socrates brought philosophy down from the heavens to dwell in the cities among human beings. Socrates rejected Aristophanes' caricature of him as a physical scientist, as a cosmologist, like Anaximander or Empedocles, with his head in the clouds, communicating with the gods about the foundations of the cosmos. One might draw a comparison here between Socrates and Confucius, who is also reported to be somewhat skeptical about cosmologically related religious practices. It was as a citizen of the city that Socrates' longtime friend, Caraphon, when visiting an oracle at Delphi, the oracle at Delphi, asked the omniscient Pythia, or priestess, of the god Apollo, whether there was anyone who possessed more Sophia 
or wisdom than Socrates. The Pythia replied in the negative that there was not. Now, the priestess at Delphi could only answer questions in yes or no, could only answer yes or no questions, sort of like the oracle bones. Uh, the oracle bones, as I understand them, are really, you can ask yes or no to something, but that's about it, you know. You can't ask for guidance, like uh, where are you supposed to attack from next. Um, Socrates says that this troubled him. While accepting that, sure, the gods did not lie, since it would be lawful for him to do so, Socrates remained painfully aware of his own ignorance. In consequence, Socrates, Socrates felt obliged to go about the city and to examine or to pry into the meaning of the words of the Pythia by interrogating those who did appear to manifest or claim wisdom. In the narrative, he distinguished three types of claimants, politicians, poets, and artisans. Interrogating politicians, Socrates found that although they all expressed great confidence, that they knew exactly what was good for the city. In truth, they contradicted each other and often even themselves, and that they were unable to give an account of the pious, the lawful, the noble, or the good. Their many claims to wisdom about the affairs of the city were more rhetoric than reality, more assertion than argument. The poets, too, although they wrote great works, were not capable of explaining them and seemed more possessed by a god than by reason. Additionally, because of the evident genius of their poems, they often made unjust claims to speak on other matters about which, in truth, they knew very little, that is, about the piety, legality, nobility, and the good. Finally, Socrates described how he went to the Charistechnus, manual craftsmen, expecting to discover that they for sure would know many things, which, in fact, they did. They possessed techne, technical knowledge, knowledge of how to work with nature, to make many useful things, such as houses and tables and beds. But these artisans made the same mistake as the poets and presumed that because they were wise in the practice of their crafts, they were wise in other matters as well. Thus foolishly overextending or contaminating their limited wisdom. So I ask myself, said Socrates, on behalf of the oracle, whether I should prefer to be as I am, neither wise in their wisdom, nor foolish in their folly, or to be in both respects as they are. I replied then to myself and to the oracle that it was better for me to be as I am. Socrates possessed what we might call negative rather than positive wisdom. As he concluded to himself, he was wiser than the many reputedly wise, simply because no one knows all that much, but others think that they know when they do not. For himself, he said, when I do not know, Neither do I think I know. So I am likely to be wiser than others in this small extent that I do not think I know what I do not know. With this narrative in the Greek city of Athens, 
Socrates set in motion in the West a long tradition of what is sometimes termed zetetic philosophy, of practicing philosophy as a form of learned ignorance. That is, ignorance not as the result of simply not knowing and not trying to know, but of knowing that and what we do not know as a result of trying to know and examining what we think we know. The story, and I think it cannot be emphasized enough how foundational it is to the West, the apology of Socrates, much more so than the Republic. The story in its own way was like the setting in motion of the wheel of the Dharma that took place in the Indian village of Sarnath when Shakyamuni Buddha first expounded the Four Noble Truths to his five companion monks. However, as the case of Socrates well illustrates, this way of life has a certain fragility and has regularly been threatened by political power, including the political power of religion. Recall again that at his trial, the charges against Socrates were that he corrupted the young and dishonored the gods. Indeed, in the West, the rise of Christianity became one of the greatest challenges to Zetetic philosophy. In the Christian tradition, the Zetetic life was confronted and even threatened by religious claims to divine or supernatural revelation. If God has revealed the truth, who are philosophers to presume to question it? Whenever the Christian church had the power to do so, it made efforts to stamp out Zetetic philosophical questioning. It put not just Socrates on trial and to death, but the very practice of philosophy itself. A practice of learned ignorance nevertheless insinuated and secreted itself into the Christian life by means of a tradition of what is called apophantic or negative theology. The argument of negative theology is that with regard to a God that is all-powerful and all-knowing, it is not possible truly to know or say anything, anything except what he is not, or that he is beyond what we can know, that he is unknowable. The mysterious paradox of belief in the existence of an all-powerful God is that to attribute any determinate attribute to him, even that he is good or all-powerful, will perforce be a kind of delimitation of his power. Shouldn't an all-powerful God be, be able, as all-powerful, not to be powerful at some times? This argument nevertheless got more than one Christian declared a heretic, if not killed, just like Socrates. Here in China, I might suggest that some traditions of Taoism can be read to echo this negative knowing with a positive voice. I'm thinking, of course, of the opening chapter of the Lao Tzu, Dao De Kao De Cheng Dao. Ming Te Ming, Fei Chen Ming. The radical character of Zhuangzi and his wild appeals to live in harmony with nature via his engagement with fantastical birds, fish, and monkeys might also be stretched into some kind of overlap with Socrates' wildness in Athens. Now, however, against this backdrop, let me make a large, unwarranted historical jump into the present. In the contemporary techno-scientific world, too, 
the practice of zetetic philosophy can easily get us in trouble. To question the importance of science, engineering, or technology in our time can easily be encouraged as corrupt a corrupting influence on the young, if not a dishonoring of the gods, meaning the gods of science, engineering, and technology. What our societies claim to need more than anything else, all of our societies tell us, Chinese, American, European, is more scientists, more engineers, more technology, and of course, more innovation. Innovation is the addiction of our time. To make any attempt to belittle chat GBT by comparing it ironically, if not unfavorably, to philosophy is not likely to be publicly endorsed or privately supported. Instead, it is the zetetic life, the life recommended by, by Socrates as the distinctly and truly human life that is itself likely to be ironically belittled. If you're so smart, why aren't you rich? As the riddle in a 1992 Batman comic had it. Although the problematic location of philosophy in the social order is perennial, it has taken on distinctive form today under conditions created by the dominance of science, engineering, and technology. One can readily identify three different but interrelated challenges. One is the claim that philosophy is itself worthless, that it's an unproductive life, and the unproductive life is not worth living by humans. A second is the attempt to demand that zetetic philosophy whenever it is practiced, keep itself focused down on the analytic detailing of small, specific problems. Don't think big, think small. A third is that even in regard to small-scale questions, philosophy should contribute to the negotiation of practical or ethical problems. This is the pragmatist demand. To resist these three challenges while avoiding nihilism is, I submit, the biggest philosophical challenge of our time. I can't offer a solution to this, but I can try to think about how such resistance might be practiced. It's what I spend most of my time doing. The truth is I have no easy answer or method. Here I can only venture three suggestions derived in part from the various references I've made in the course of my historical philosophical overview. A very superficial and cursory overview, I might add. One is to practice among friends. We might call this a Confucian suggestion. Two is simply to keep on questioning the Socratic principle. Three is to practice mindfulness, a Buddhist admonition that echoes the one at Delphi, know thyself. And as a fourth, an addition, we might draw on Taoism to honor nature in its mysteriousness and altogether seek to cultivate an appreciation of goods beyond those of material affluence and technological power, while appreciating the strong influence of material culture on the good life. This last paragraph is, however, little more than wishful rhetorical thinking that deserves itself to be subjected to genetic challenge. Thank you.